So I've been wanting to do story time on the channel for a while now and I haven't gotten around to it till today. It seems only appropriate to kick it off uh, in light of the man's untimely death yesterday. Let's talk about my experiences with the late and great Edward Van Halen. Welcome back to the Timeless Watch channel, guys. As always, before I get into anything, what am I wearing? I am wearing the Rose Gold Yachtmaster on the Oyster Flex bracelet. This is an absolutely stunning piece. I'm gonna do a review on it in the next couple of weeks. As a kind of a bookend to the first year of the channel, the very first video I put out almost a year ago now, is uh, or almost exactly a year ago now was the rhodium dial uh yamaster 40 one of my favorite watches ever and uh the very first video i put on the channel actually i put out like seven videos on the same day i don't know what i was thinking but that was the first one to be uploaded uh, so it felt fitting to do another yacht master uh for the first birthday uh the one year the first year birthday of the of the channel so as kind of bookends you know so i feel like i should talk about eddie eddie just passed away yesterday eddie van halen one of the most iconic characters in rock music probably in the top five rock guitarists in history we went on tour with them i was on tour with them for i don't know five or six seven shows i'm not i can't quite recall how many we were doing a lot of touring back then between the years of like 2003 to 2007 i think that was kind of our our kind of peak moment for for gigging and so on. that's when the band was kind of most popular the band's name by the way is mr north you can google it There's tons of stuff all over the place so we were uh picked up by william morris agency back in 2003 i believe if i remember correctly uh by a very significant character in the in the music industry by the name of uh, Barbara Skydell. She was kind of a legend in, in the industry, uh, brought bands like Led Zeppelin and The Who and so on over to America and U2. And she fell in love with our band and decided we were going to be her next U2 or whatever and um, immediately started putting us out with enormous acts, getting us in front of 15, 20,000 people kind of stuff. It was it was a big jump for us. We were we weren't very used to that. We were normally playing before that. We were just playing bars and little clubs and venues and so on. Um, and next thing we were on these enormous stages. But the Van Halen one came along in it was 2005 uh, when we were notified that we were going to go out with them for a few shows. <laughs> it was really weird for me because you know I kind of grew up listening to Van Halen. I'm not going to say I was the biggest Van Halen, Van Halen fan. I knew all their stuff, but I wasn't like a diehard fan or anything. But it was still a kind of legendary uh, metal rock band. And uh, also that guitarist, Eddie, just like no like no other guitarist that existed. He was a phenomenal, kind of almost supersonic kind of person. Now we'd opened for a lot of different acts during those years. We, we opened for The Who, believe it or not, uh, a couple of times. We did a tour with Brian Adams. We did a tour with Journey, various other bands. Uh, so we were getting used to kind of how it how it works when you go out on tour with big bands like that. But the, the one with Van Halen, the little stint there, whatever it was, five, six, seven shows, something like that, um, was very, uh, it had a few things about it that were very different. And one of them involves Eddie himself. For one, it was kind of at a different scale. It was on a different scale. Like we'd been out with other large bands. But this had a whole other scale. This was like, 
it was like an empire. It felt like the crew was just never ending. It was an enormous crew. Uh, so many trucks, you know, huge 40, 60 foot trucks parked out back with all their equipment and so on, and a very elaborate uh, stage setup. Uh, as well as that, backstage felt like a carnival. It was really odd. Normally, backstage is somewhat of a kind of a private and professional environment. It's just equipment and people walking around, uh, taking care of stuff and so on. Whereas backstage with Van Halen almost felt like a bit of a, a show itself. All their equipment had, you know, it was all very colorful and everything was kind of set up to look really fantastical. And uh, we found out very quickly why there's a thing that some bands do called uh, or most bands do a meet and greet which is when you um, you meet your audience uh, or at least you meet your your biggest fans like in every town there's a, a, a die-hard fan club for whatever band you know a lot of different bands do it in different ways some bands come out and they you know they meet them they shake their hands they take photos and so on and other bands have different ways of doing it uh, what they would do with Van Halen is they would they had all the diehards would come along and would be greeted by this kind of this kind of um, tour guide who would bring them around and show them all the equipment and everything and they would even get to see some of Van Halen's sound check and actually sit there in the in the seats by themselves and have a kind of a, almost like a private show of their own while Van Halen you know got in and just jammed for 20 minutes it was part of the meet and greet I'm not sure they ever met the band themselves but one of the things was they were brought around backstage looking at everything and this tour guide would be like and this is where they do control all the lights and over here is where they control all the sound and these are Eddie's guitars his backup guitars and so on all these fans like gripping their vinyl copy you know hoping to get it signed or a photo of the band or whatever and their Van Halen caps on and jackets on you know diehard fans but we were in our in our green room in our dressing room and every night the door would just flip open and it would be all the it would be the tour guide going and this is the support band for the evening mr north <laughs> a couple of the times i didn't even have my pants on i'm like what the hell are you doing get out of here this is like a private dressing room they just open up all these people staring in like looking you know curious eyes just staring in to check out who you wear and so it was kind of weird it felt like a circus backstage very odd um, but one thing that really, that really made me like Eddie, when you do these tours, you don't, it takes a while for the, the main band to even know who you are or pay any attention to you. You know, a lot of these big acts, they have no idea even if there was an opening act on. They arrive at the venue five minutes before they're supposed to go on stage, they don't care. And even if they are there, quite often they just, they ignore you anyway they just it could take some time for example with Brian Adams you know we'd we'd open up and then go off and then he'd come on and do his big show and the crew got to know us and they really liked us they really enjoyed our stuff and I think the crew went to Brian after five or six shows or something and said look you should really say hello to these guys in this opening band they're really good and and you know, eventually the, those main acts would come in to the green room and come meet you and say, hey, I hear you guys are great and you've been opening for my, for my show for the past while and so on. And uh, that's usually what would happen. Then sometimes the bands would be, they'd have a private place at the back of the venue and they'd actually watch your act and then come and see you. But um, it wasn't always guaranteed that you would even meet the band that you were opening for just wasn't it did happen in most cases for us but it wasn't a guarantee well <laughs> Van Halen were a totally different thing we got there the first night it was San Antonio Texas that was the first show we did with them I'll never forget it because I actually wound up in the hospital after I was in a car accident a few days before and I wasn't I was feeling kind of weird for a few days and the paramedics Van Halen's paramedics took a look at me and they said maybe you should go to the do the show <laughs> you do the show the show must go on but then go straight to the hospital and have yourself checked up so I wound up in the San Antonio hospital there in the ER so uh, I'll never forget where it was but 
we sound checked and uh, went into the green room to freshen up, you know, change, shower and change, whatever, have a beer, loosen up for the show. And the door flies open. This is the first night. We haven't even played a show with them yet. The door flies open and it's Eddie. Eddie Van Halen just jumps into our green room and goes like this and sticks his tongue out. He has a big black tongue because he had, he had cancer of the mouth. That guy had a lot of his tongue and mouth removed years ago. He's a chain smoker. And he just leaps in. We're like, we thought we, we weren't even sure we didn't even meet these guys during the whole process. And in he comes like this, unannounced. We're like, whoa, it's Eddie fucking Van Halen. And he sat there, we all had drinks and laughs and super down to earth. Uh, even kind of self-deprecating a little. He's like, oh, I just, you know what I do in the guitar? I just fuck off in the guitar. That's, he's like, I just fuck around. I don't, I just, I don't even know what I'm going to play. I just uh, play my solo. I just mess around, you know. He was like a big kid. It was really cool and down to earth and friendly and fun and welcoming. One cool thing was we went out on stage, you know, when we were sound checking and I was like, well, where are the wedges? You know, these little speakers that are wedge-shaped speakers like this that you use to monitor your own instrument and hear your, you know, your other players in the band. So I'm looking around for the, for the wedges and there's no in-ears. Like a lot of bands use the in-ear monitor as a little thing in your ear so you can hear your own instrument. You're not hearing the front of the house. Like the front of the house is those enormous speakers that are left and right of the stage to point at the audience. And they're huge and they're really loud and they've, they've got to project the whole show to the audience. We don't use those on stage. We don't hear it. When you're on the stage, you don't hear those really. Uh, unless it reflects off the back of the, of the venue and comes, slaps back at you like a second later, which is a mess. Uh, we don't use those for reference. We have our own stuff. And a lot of stages are quite quiet on the stage. They're not, uh, you know, because you, you want to just hear everything nice and stay in time. You don't need to hear the big show that everyone else is hearing. Uh, so I couldn't find, there was no in-ears, there was no wedges. I'm like, where are we going to hear our, like, how am I going to hear my brother on guitar is 60 feet over there. <laughs> I'm not going to hear his amp from here. So we start playing. I thought like blood was going to come out of my ears. The volume was enormous. And I looked up and I saw, I realized that the front of house speakers, those enormous rows and rows of speakers that are hanging down either side of the stage, had another set identical behind them turned around and faced towards back, back at the stage. A front, an entire front of house rig was pointed back at the stage. <laughs> with the same volume so i was like we're hearing the front of house in our face it was i was like touching my bass going boom and it was like my head was exploding it was the loudest moment of my life. i've had loud moments of you know played next to the loudest drummer in the history of drummers for years i definitely have damaged hearing and i've been i played a lot of loud shows and loud player myself but that was a whole other level of loud. That was like a 747 jet landing, you know. But it was really, it was a stark reminder, these guys, these guys are real rock and rollers. These guys are just, they're not concerned with in-ears and comforts. They're swigging whiskey on the stage and smoking cigarettes and rocking out. It was real, <laughs> it was a real reminder that these guys are like the real deal. Now, there were a few things that weren't so weren't so great. There was there was some oddness going on. Unfortunately, that band were kind of well known for having, you know, member to member conflict, which is probably one of the reasons. I, I believe it's one of the reasons why Dave Lee Roth, their original singer, was kind of chucked out of the band and they replaced him with Sammy Hager, who was a lovely guy. Also, they were all lovely guys actually to us anyway, uh, but not so lovely to one another. It seems that things were a little strange with Sammy and. He would come in on one side of the venue, he'd arrive in to do the show and they would arrive in the other side and they would have different backstage areas on opposite sides of the back of the arena or whatever it was. And they would 
come into the stage on one he would come up one side of the stage and they would come up on the other meet on the stage play the gig for three hours and then or two two hours 20 or whatever it was and then go their separate ways leave the stage on the opposite sides and because they didn't want to see each other backstage they just wanted to do the show be professional entertain everyone appear friendly on the stage but then just go their opposite ways so that was that was tough to see as a young band just seeing that kind of stuff it's like wow you guys are all multi-millionaires and you know, you've, you've you've got you've done you've got the rock and roll dream you know and you still have found a way to be unhappy <laughs> which just stunned me but uh I guess I shouldn't be too surprised because my band ended up <laughs> being a little bit the same, although not quite on the same scale. There was some other stuff as well that was odd. They had certain rules, like a band like us, we would have our merchandise, you know, we'd have a small stand, we'd do festivals and so on, we'd have like four or five different t-shirts to choose from and a couple of CDs to buy or maybe, I don't know, maybe a, like our official record and then some other s smaller stuff, EP kind of stuff to sell and uh, it was a good way to make extra cash you know if you play a big festival and there's 10,000 people 20,000 people all you need is a few hundred of them to love your band and you know then you've, you're going to sell some cds and t-shirts and that'll put gas in the tank and it'll pay for motel rooms and sandwiches and things <clears throat> and uh, it was the weirdest thing because other bands like journey and so on that we toured with They'd have no problem, you know, we'd sell our merch next to the merch stand for the main band. Like the Journey merch stand was quite substantial, as you can imagine. T-shirts, jackets, you know, mugs, pens, whatever. And uh, we'd sell our stuff right next to them, you know. And uh, with, with Van Halen, there was such a corporate attitude. You know, whoever the management were, it was probably like a group of very grumpy people because they had all these rules, you know, it was like, first of all, we weren't being paid. Like Brian Adams paid us well, Journey paid us well, all these other festivals, they paid us well. Um, we weren't being paid for the, for the Van Halen shows. It was like the privilege of playing with Van Halen, you know, the privilege to play to a Van Halen audience, which does have a currency to it, it does have, uh, a value for sure for sure we made a lot of fans a lot of fans from the from that tour so yes but it's also very hard like you're going from venue to venue like they've got trucks they've got 60 trucks across the country and while they're playing one gig in one city you know 800 miles away in the other direction they've got another bunch of trucks setting up tomorrow's gig or the day after tomorrow's set you know the stage set Whereas we don't have any of that. We're a smaller band. We've got our, you know, our van and our trailer with all our gear. Like we've got to just drive, get our gear and drive to the next show. So quite often on that gig, on that tour, some of the distances were enormous. There was a, it was a flat two day drive. It was, you know, there's no time to stop really. Just bathroom breaks, but then you're back on the road again. Otherwise you're not going to make it in time. So, uh, Quite often we'd want to party with the guys after, but uh, you know, Michael Anthony, he loves his uh, Jack Daniels. He has a Jack Daniels bass, a bit cheesy, but he's a fun guy, nice guy. And he's like, come on, let's go all get drunk on whiskey. And we're like, oh, we've got to go. If we don't leave now, we won't see you in time at, you know, Flagstaff, you know, uh, New Mexico in two days. We have to leave now in order to get there just in time for the show in two days. So uh, it was pretty crazy and they were taking their management, not them, they were taking a cut of our merchandise, which I just thought, I still can't get over it today. Like we had a bunch of merch. We were, if we were lucky, we'd make six or 800 bucks on a good night, you know, and they would take a cut. I can't remember, I think it was 20% or something, Van Halen or at least the corporation that is, the empire that is Van Halen, needed to take a little cut of our merch. And they wouldn't let us sell all our stuff. They would only let us sell two of our t-shirts. We had to pick our favorite two and one of our CDs. 
Whereas their merch stand was outrageous. It must have been 80 feet long. It was like more t-shirts than you've ever seen in your life, different types. Jackets, like expensive, beautiful leather jackets, beautiful stuff, all high quality, all very expensive. They started picking up our merch and putting it in with theirs in the trucks because we didn't have time. We let them, the merch sell. We'd have to get on the road. And what would happen is we'd see them in the next uh, town and they'd say, hey, here's, you know, here's the money you made from the previous gig, minus their 20% that they had to take. And one of the times, I'll never forget it because our road guy said, I can't believe it. You know, he said, uh, we, we arrived and the merch guy is like, hey, you guys did well at the last show. You guys made like 700 bucks or something. So there's your money minus the 20%. And uh, our guy is like, yeah, cool, thanks. How did you guys do? <laughs> and the guy says, oh, I think we did 200, 210 thousand dollars in merch in one night <laughs> and they had to take our 20 percent of our merch Woo. but it wasn't the band it wasn't eddie it wasn't the guys it was just their their management like on one of the last nights the last night we played with them we're backstage while they're all doing their solo all their solos are like 20 minutes long i think michael was doing his big bass solo and the band just the rest of the band just leave the stage and wait backstage have a beer have a smoke and a chat while they're waiting for the guy to finish his solo and uh we're backstage and eddie it's me and the sing my singer and eddie and alex and they're like you guys are great we love you guys You're a great band you guys have to finish the tour with us there's another band gigging with us we don't like them very much we want you guys to finish the tour let's you know Let's organize that. And we said, look, definitely, we'd love to do it, but you know, you gotta pay us something. Cause you know, we're running on empty here, like chasing you guys around the country. We don't even want much money. We just need enough for, you know, motels and sandwiches and you know, gas in the tank. We're not even looking for a profit or anything, but just to keep us running while we're doing it. And Eddie looked at me and goes, we're not paying you? We're, what? you guys aren't getting paid for this like no he didn't even know of course he wouldn't now that i think of it you know but in my innocence back then i was like how does he not know how their band works with these things and he turned to alex he's like did you hear these guys ain't getting paid and alex you guys don't get paid for this stuff oh shit okay <laughs> and they said you know what we're going to take care of it eddie said Eddie, the man himself, said, we'll take care of it. You guys are finishing the tour with us. We're gonna get you guys paid for the gigs. Don't worry about it. We immediately got on the phone to our management in New York. And we're like, hey, they said that they want us to finish the tour and they're gonna cover our, you know, our costs for it and so on. And our management in New York were like, that doesn't sound right. Let's, let's confirm that before you get excited. We're like, well, come on, it's Eddie, it's Alex. Like, who has more power in this empire than them? Well, it turns out somebody does. Or at least somebody is signing the checks. And uh, the next day, we got the call from management going, yeah, yeah, uh, they said no. Not the band, management, you know, whoever's behind that machine signing the checks. They're just like, no, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> So I appreciated Eddie's gesture, but he would have had to probably kick down some doors on our behalf, which is too much to ask. So that was the end of that. We just did those few gigs, but they, they were cool and the, the crew were cool. They would take our gear, you know, uh, they'd be like, you know what, leave your gear. You guys have to get on the road. Otherwise you're not going to make the next gig in Vegas or whatever it is. Uh, we'll take your stuff. You know, we're like, are you sure? That's great. That's going to save us so much time. And they're like, yeah, we have like 40 trucks parked out. Back of your gear is going to take a tiny corner of one of them. Don't worry about it. So we get to the next gig and all our gear is set up exactly in the same place. They have it all marked out on the stage, of course. And uh, yeah, impressive. Very cool. And Eddie, very down to earth. I used to go out and watch him do his solo 
And uh, I, I remember just thinking, that guy's a, he's like a big kid. He never grew up. I remember thinking, this is, this is what happens when a man, this is one of the things that can happen when a man refuses to, to grow up. He just refused to let that little boy, that crazy adventurous boy in him die. He just, he just messes around and has fun. I mean, the other thing that can happen if you don't mature and grow up is you wind up homeless or something. But in his case, he became a rock god. It's amazing, really. What an incredible dude. He was 50 at the time. I remember he kept saying that over and over again. Well, I'm 50 now, but look, he pulls up his top. He's like, look at my abs. And he had tanned 5150, which is one of their album titles. He had tanned it into his chest. So he was clearly he was getting into a sunbed with the numbers on his chest so they wouldn't tan under there. So he could tan it into a 50 year old man behaving like a 13 year old boy his whole life, amazing. And what a guitarist, what an amazing talent. So there it is guys, I figured you might appreciate uh, those stories. It's gonna be a great loss now to the, to the rock world. Uh, so many guitarists are gonna be very sad today. Oh, that's another thing by the way, I'll just throw this in at the end. The stage was VH, you know? with the circles. If you're a Van Halen fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And in those circles were the diehard fans. They were put inside those circles. It's like their own area separated from the rest of the audience. So of course, on Eddie's side of the stage, they're all like Eddie Van Halen nuts, clearly into guitar. So my brother who plays, played guitar in my band for years, he was clearly on that side of the stage because we have a similar setup. I was on that side, he was on this side. And he would, he'd be playing and all these guys, would, all these fans would already be in there. They'd watch our set, then they'd wait for Van Halen to come on. So they were watching my brother play guitar and he started noticing a few gigs in that they were watching every single thing he did. Like he'd walk over to his pedal board to hit a pedal with his foot. And then he'd see in the corner of his eye, he'd see all the faces going, which pedal is he pressing? And you know, you think the watch world is nerdy? Try the guitar world, that shit is wild. They're all like, mm, what's that? What strings is, that? is he using? Uh, what gauge, of, you know, what's, what's his tuning? You know, like they get super nerdy on that stuff. It's just like this stuff, guys. So he found himself, after a couple of shows, we, re we started hearing him. My, you know, Emmett putting in some extra licks and stuff because he was like trying to give the guys something to watch. <laughs> They're waiting for like so we're playing our songs that don't have any of that kind of guitar work in them, and he we're starting hearing him or like looking over. Going, What's he doing over there? <laughs> He's like doing extra stuff just to give spoon feed these guitar freaks something to watch. That was a funny part. Anyway, I'm rambling now. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, story time. I'll do this every once in a while. Sometimes it'll include watches. I have some cool watch stories from the streets of New York and some other stuff to divulge. Oh, this is gonna be an interesting adventure. This, a lot of this stuff I've never spoken about before to anyone. And now I'm gonna make it all public. Oh boy. Hope it doesn't get me in trouble. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that story time. Rest in peace, Eddie, you legend. And uh, I will see you guys in the next one. I'm gonna do a review of this uh, Yachty. So that's gonna be beautiful. I'll give you guys a shot of a watch at the very end. Why not? Because I didn't really talk about watches the whole time. And I've got some cool other reviews coming up too. So look out for those. Thanks again for watching the Timeless Watch channel. I'll see you in the next one.